Hello listeners, this is the reading of the Sabbath School lesson for the fourth and final quarter of 2023. This week's lesson is titled, God's Mission to Us, Part 2, and it's from the series God's Mission, Our Mission, and is ready for teaching on Sabbath, October 14. The lessons have been authored by the directors of six global mission centres around the world, under the leadership of Dr. Gary Krauss of Adventist Mission. Your reader is Percy Harold. Sabbath afternoon, October 7. Before we start, let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, once again we thank you for your word and we thank you that in this word we find not our responsibility but the love and grace and gift that you give to us of being able to share your love with those about us just as Jesus came and shared his love and your love with the people of his time. And Lord, as we open your word this week, as we look at what mission is, we pray that our hearts may be open to the infilling of your spirit, the guiding of your spirit as we open your word. May the words jump out at us and show us what you want from us. Lord, as we're studying your word today and through this week, I'd like to pray for Andronica Wells and family. Uh, And I pray particularly that each of them may just love your word. And for Perla Caraveo in Loma Linda, who's listening. And for Sandra Robinson, a faithful Seventh-day Adventist who listens as well. And Jaldemir Santos from Brazil and your entire international English Sabbath school class. Lord, I pray that you will be with each of them and with Keith Maynard Sr. of St. Kitts and Nevis, who has requested prayer, and Marcia Campbell. Lord, for each of these people and for everyone who's listening, I pray that this week will be not just a good week, but a a week when we walk with you one by one. Bless us now, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Our memory text this week is Matthew 28 and verse 19. Go therefore and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Let's read that again. Matthew 28 verse 19. Go therefore and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. The theme, that of God as a God of mission, runs throughout Scripture. It is the connecting thread of human history, and it demonstrates God's purpose for His creation. Furthermore, it consolidates divine revelation with a main focus, the restoration of God's image in His fallen children. As we read in Colossians 3, verses 9 and 10, Do not lie to one another, since you have put off the old man with his deeds, and have put on the new man, who is renewed in knowledge according to the image of him who created him. And we compare that with 1 John 3, verse 2, Beloved, Now we are children of God, and it has not yet been revealed what we shall be, but we know that when he is revealed, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. The mission of God also functions as the background through which we should see and understand God's word to us. When we read the Bible, we can identify a God who is intentionally reaching out to us. In spite of the separation caused by sin that we read about in Isaiah 59 too, through his mission, God continues to restore the broken relationship with humanity until the glorious moment when he will make all things new. Let's look at Isaiah 59 and verse 2. But your iniquities have separated you from your God, and your sins have hidden his face from you, so that he will not hear. But we read in Revelation 21 verse 5. Then he who sat on the throne said, Behold, I make all things new. And he said to me, Write, for these words are true and faithful. In the meantime, 
God has chosen to manifest himself to us in such a way that we can understand his nature and purpose and above all, we can have a real and lasting relationship with him. In other words, we not only come to him, but also share with others our experience with him and his saving love. In the scriptures then, God gives us the basic elements of what his mission is all about. Sunday, October 8, The Triune God, The Origin of Mission The mission of God in Scripture has Jesus at the front and centre as the only way to salvation. Christ himself declared in John 14, verse 6, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. But Jesus also helps us understand the centrality of the triune God to his mission. Everything Christ did was either for or from his heavenly Father. As we read in John 4.34, Jesus said to them, My food is to do the will of him who sent me and to finish his work. And John 5 verse 30, I can of myself do nothing. As I hear, I judge, and my judgment is righteous, because I do not seek my own will, but the will of the Father who sent me, and John 12, verse 45, and he who sees me sees him who sent me. However, we must always remember that Jesus' mission did not begin when he came into the world. He had received it from the Father even before the creation of our world. As you read in Ephesians 1, verse 4, Just as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before him in love. And 1 Peter 1, verse 20, He indeed was foreordained before the foundation of the world, but was manifest in these last times for you. Therefore, God planned his outreach to humanity even before he laid the foundations of our planet, and he intentionally entered into humanity's history in order to accomplish this purpose. The Son created the world, we read in John 1 verse 3, and at the fullness of time in Galatians 4 verse 4, God demonstrated his love by sending the Son here, we read in John 3, 16 and 17. Let's look at those three texts right now. John 1 3 reads, All things were made through him, and without him nothing was made that was made. And Galatians 4, four. But when the fullness of time had come, God sent forth his Son, born of a woman, born under the law. And John 3, verses 16 and 17, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. The Son came, died on the cross, and conquered death. Then, sent from the Father, the Spirit came here, as we read in John 14.26 and John 16.7, and convicts the world, as we read in John 16.8-11, and today continues the mission of the Father and the Son by empowering and by sending God's people out for mission. So we read John 14 and verse 26. But the Helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things and bring to your remembrance all things that I said to you. And John 16, verse 7, Nevertheless, I tell you the truth, it is to your advantage that I go away. For if I do not go away, the Helper will not come to you. But if I depart, I will send him to you. And John 16, verses 13 to 14, However, when he, the Spirit of truth, has come, he will guide you into all truth. For he will not speak of his own authority, 
But whatever he hears, he will speak, and he will tell you things to come. He will glorify me, for he will take of what is mine and declare it to you. Chapter 16, verses 8 to 11. And when he has come, he will convict the world of sin and of righteousness and of judgment, of sin because they do not believe in me, of righteousness because I go to my Father and you see me no more, of judgment because the ruler of this world is judged. Read John chapter 20 verses 21 and 22. How should the understanding that mission finds its origin in the Father, Son and the Holy Spirit shape our mission? John 20, beginning at verse 21. So Jesus said to them again, Peace to you. As the Father has sent me, I also send you. And when he had said this, he breathed on them and said to them, Receive the Holy Ghost. Even though the word Trinity is not found in the Bible, mission-focused evidences involving all three persons of the Godhead are numerous. For instance, after his resurrection, Christ appeared to his disciples and promised them in Luke 24-49, I am going to send you what my Father has promised, but stay in the city until you have been clothed with power on high. Here we find the reality of the Godhead's mission in one sentence. The Father's promise, the Son's assurance of the fulfilment of the promise, and the promise itself, the coming of the Holy Spirit. We'll Four and five, and being assembled together with them, he commanded them not to depart from Jerusalem, but to wait for the promise of the Father, which, he said, you have heard from me. For John truly baptized with water, but you shall be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. And Acts 1 verse 8, but you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you shall be witnesses to me in Jerusalem and in all Judea, and Samaria, and to the end of the earth. We learn from this that the mission is not ours. It belongs to the triune God. As such, it will not fail. And so to finish the day, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit are all involved in the work of saving souls. Why should you find this thought so comforting? Monday, October 9, Making Disciples the Focus of Mission. Read Matthew 28, verses 16 to 20. What elements of discipleship can you identify in this passage? Matthew 28, beginning at verse 16. Then the eleven disciples went away into Galilee, to the mountain which Jesus had appointed for them. When they saw him, they worshipped him, but some doubted. And Jesus came and spoke to them, saying, All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things that I have commanded you. And, lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age." Matthew twenty eight sixteen to 20 declares the biblical mandate, commonly identified as the Great Commission. That's actually verses 18 to 20, in which Jesus instructs his followers to move outward and make disciples, teaching them in faith and initiating them into fellowship. We also see more about this in the other Gospels, in Mark 16, verses 16 to 20. Sorry, verses 15 to 16. And he said to them, Go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. He who believes and is baptized will be saved, but he who does not believe will be 
condemned. And Luke 24, verses 44 to 49, Then he said to them, These are the words that I spoke to you while I was still with you, that all things must be fulfilled which were written in the law of Moses and the prophets and the Psalms concerning me. And he opened their understanding that they might comprehend the Scriptures. Then he said to them, Thus it is written, and thus it was necessary for the Christ to suffer and to rise from the dead the third day, and that repentance and remission of sins should be preached in his name to all nations, beginning at Jerusalem. And you are witnesses of these things. Behold, I send the promise of my Father upon you, but tarry in the city of Jerusalem until you are endued with power from on high. And then in John chapter 20, verses 21 to 23, we read, So Jesus said to them again, Peace to you, as the Father has sent me, I also send you. And when he had said this, he breathed on them and said to them, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven them. If you retain the sins of any, they are retained. And Acts chapter 1, verse 8 But you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you shall be witnesses to me in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the end of the earth. The basic components of Matthew 28, 16-20 can be seen in four simple aspects. 1. Jesus commands his disciples to go to Galilee to be with him. We read that in Matthew 28. Jesus comes to them declaring his authority and sovereignty. We read that in verse 18. Jesus then commissions his disciples to a specific task, namely make disciples in verses 19 and 20. And finally, number four, Jesus promises to be with his disciples until the end in verse 20. Disciple-making is the primary focus of the Great Commission and the main task of mission. Literally, in the original Greek language, the beginning of Matthew 28.19 says, Having gone, therefore, make disciples. The therefore gives to the commission its foundation on what has just been presented in verse 18, Jesus' power, authority and sovereignty, all these coming from the victory attained in his resurrection. It is important to highlight that the only action verb with imperative force in the Great Commission is make disciples. Teaching everyone, baptizing them, and sharing Jesus' teachings to the whole world are the characteristics of the discipleship process. Here, Jesus is clearly directing his disciples toward one purpose, making disciples. This is indeed one of the greatest mission passages in all of Scripture. It ends with Jesus' promise of continuous presence with his followers. Obviously, the Great Commission was intended to be far more than just the first disciples gathered in that particular circumstance. They could not go to all nations by themselves in order to fulfill the new given mission of making disciples. Therefore, the commission is universal in its scope. Every true follower of Jesus Christ should be engaged in disciple-making. Furthermore, the message to be conveyed, the eternal gospel of Jesus Christ, is intended for the whole world, with no geographical, social or ethnic limitations. The mission is to make disciples. How is this mandate of the Master affecting how you live and minister to others? How can you be involved? Tuesday, October 10, The Eternal Gospel, The Message of Mission Read Revelation chapter 14, verses 6 and 7. What aspects of God's mission can you identify in the eternal gospel presented by the first angel of the three angels' messages? 
So we read from Revelation 14, beginning at verse 6. Then I saw another angel flying in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel to preach to those who dwell on the earth, to every nation, tribe, tongue, and people, saying with a loud voice, Fear God and give glory to him, for the hour of his judgment has come, and worship him who made heaven and earth, the sea, and springs of water. This is the only place in Scripture in which the words eternal and gospel are connected. The gospel is the good news of grace offered to all through Jesus Christ. He came into our world to show us grace and truth. We read in John 1.14, And the word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. He lived a sinless life and died on the cross as a substitutionary sacrifice to bear the penalty of our sins, as we read in Isaiah 53 and verses 4 and 5. Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions, he was bruised for our iniquities, the chastisement for our peace was upon him, and by his strife. We are healed. And First Peter chapter 3 and verse 18. For Christ also suffered once for sins, the just for the unjust, that he might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh, but made alive by the Spirit. He rose to life, returned to heaven, was exalted by the Father, and today intercedes for us in the heavenly sanctuary, as we read in Revelation 1 verse 18. I am he who lives and was dead, and behold, I am alive forevermore. Amen. And I have the keys of Hades and death. And Acts chapter 2 and verse 33. Therefore, being exalted to the right hand of God and having received from the Father the promise of the Holy Spirit, he poured out this, which you now see and hear. And Hebrews chapter 7, verse 25. And that reads, Therefore he is also able to save to the uttermost those who come to God through him, since he always lives to make intercession for them. He will soon fulfill his greatest promise to return in majesty and glory and ultimately after the millennium to establish God's kingdom on earth. As we find in John 14, 1 to 4, Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God. Believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you, and if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself, that where I am, there you may be also. And where I go you know, and the way you know. And Acts chapter 1 verse 11, who also said, Men of Galilee, why do you stand gazing up into heaven? This same Jesus, who was taken up from you into heaven, will so come in like manner as you saw him go into heaven. And Revelation 21 verses 1 to 4, Now I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away. Also there was no more sea. Then I, John, saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men, and he will dwell with them, and they shall be his people. God himself will be with them and be their God, and God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. There shall be no more death nor sorrow, nor crying. There shall be no more pain, for the former things have passed away. These are all essential realities in the eternal gospel. Nevertheless, the fact that this message is eternal is remarkable. There is only one gospel that can save us. It will remain the same until the mission of God is fully accomplished. There will never be another gospel. 
deceitful teachings and doctrines come and go. But the message of salvation, the eternal gospel, is unchanging, and those who believe and live it in obedience will be rewarded. As we read in Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 14, that we should no longer be children tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine by the trickery of men in the cunning craftiness of deceitful plotting. And also in Deuteronomy 5.33, you shall walk in all the ways which the Lord your God has commanded you, that you may live, and that it may be well with you, and that you may prolong your days in the land which you shall possess. And Romans 2, verse 6, who will render to each one according to his deeds. The same commission given to the first disciples also is given to us today. We must continue the task of making disciples for Christ everywhere. But what kind of disciples? Good, honest, fully devoted, loving people? These traits are essential, but they are not enough. We must make disciples focused on all biblical elements of discipleship. As you read in Luke 9.23, Then he said to them all, If anyone desires to come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. And John 13 verses 34 and 35. A new commandment I give to you, that you love one another as I have loved you, that you also love one another. By this all will know that you are my disciples, if you have love one for another. And 2 Corinthians 5, 17. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. And so, with an ultimate purpose, being prepared and preparing others for the second coming of the Master, Jesus Christ. Ellen White writes in Christ Object Lessons, page 227 to 228, The proclamation of the judgment of Revelation 14, 6 and 7 is an announcement of Christ's second coming as at hand, and this proclamation is called the everlasting gospel. Thus, the preaching of Christ's second coming, the announcement of his nearness, is shown to be an essential part of the gospel message. End of quote. And so to finish today... How is the concept of judgment linked to the everlasting gospel in the first angel's message? Why must the gospel be central to the idea of judgment? Wednesday, October 11. God's people, the channels of mission. Throughout history, God has always had those who faithfully represented his character and, in obedience, followed his purposes. God's people are those who have been called and who have accepted his invitation to be partakers of his grace. All of them have been and continue to be God's instruments for the fulfillment of his mission. Read Genesis chapter 12, verses 1 to 3, and Deuteronomy 7, verses 6, 11, and 12. What was God's original purpose for his people in the Old Testament? Genesis 12, beginning at verse 1. Now the Lord had said to Abram, Get out of your country, from your family, and from your father's house, to a land that I will show you. I will make you a great nation, I will bless you, and make your name great. And you shall be a blessing, I will bless those who bless you, and I will curse him who curses you, and in you all the families of the earth shall be blessed. And Deuteronomy 7 verse 6, For you are a holy people to the Lord your God. The Lord your God has chosen you to be a people for himself, a special treasure above all the peoples on the face of the earth. And from verse 11, Therefore you shall keep the commandment, the statutes and the judgments which I command you today to observe them. Then it shall come to pass, because you listen to these judgments and keep and do them, that the Lord your God will keep with you the covenant and the mercy which he swore to your fathers. God's covenant with Abraham and his descendants had a specific purpose. They were called, 
created and commissioned to be agents of God's mission, channels of blessings to the nations. We compare here Deuteronomy 28 verse 10, Then all peoples of the earth shall see that you are called by the name of the Lord, and they shall be afraid of you. And Isaiah 49 verse 6, Indeed, he says, It is too small a thing that you should be my servant to raise up the tribes of Jacob and to restore the preserved ones of Israel. I will also give you as a light to the Gentiles that you should be my salvation to the ends of the earth. They were chosen within a covenant relationship with God based on an implied conditionality of faith and obedience, as we read in Genesis 22, verses 16 to 18, and said, By myself I have sworn, says the Lord, because you have done this thing and have not withheld your son, your only son, blessing I will bless you, and multiplying I will multiply your descendants as the stars of the heaven and as the sand which is on the seashore, and your descendants shall possess the gate of the their enemies. In your seed, all the nations of the earth shall be blessed because you have obeyed my voice. And Exodus chapter 19, verses 5 and 6. Now therefore, if you will indeed obey my voice and keep my covenant, then you shall be a special treasure to me above all people, for all the earth is mine, and you shall be to me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. These are the words which you shall speak to the children of Israel. In Deuteronomy chapter 28, verses 1 and 2. Now it shall come to pass, if you diligently obey the voice of the Lord your God to observe carefully all his commandments which I command you today that the Lord your God will set you high above all nations of the earth and all these blessings shall come upon you and overtake you because you obey the voice of the Lord your God and Second Chronicles 7 and verse 14 if my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways then I will hear from heaven and will forgive their sin and heal their their land. This process, that of attracting the surrounding nations to Israel, was God's mission strategy in the Old Testament. In the New Testament, God's mission continues. The risen Saviour and Lord now launches a renewed mission strategy, as we read in Matthew 28 and Acts 1, in which Christ's disciples, who comprise the church, go out in mission to the whole world, instead of, as with ancient Israel, the world coming to it. Matthew 28, beginning at verse 18, And Jesus came and spoke to them, saying, All authority has been given to me in heaven and earth. Go therefore and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things that I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. And Acts chapter 1 verse 8. But you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you shall be witnesses to me in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the end of the earth. Mission did not originate with the church. On the contrary, the church exists because God still has a mission to be fulfilled and is using his church to fulfill it. Yet a question remains, what is the church's mission? It is the same as that of the one who called the church into existence in Luke 19.10, for the Son of Man came to seek and to save the lost. Though none of us in the church can save anyone, we can and must point others to the only one who can save, Jesus Christ. The mission of the Church of Christ, Ellen White writes in Testimonies for the Church, Volume 5, page 381, is to save perishing sinners. It is to make known the love of God to men and to win them to Christ by the efficacy of that love. End of quote. What a privilege and tremendous responsibility. And so to finish today, 
Mission is to the church what air is to our lives. Without air, we die. Without mission, the church dies. What can you do, personally, to sustain the life of your church? Thursday, October 12, The World, the Area of Mission Read Revelation 7, verses 9 and 10. What does this text suggest about the far-reaching geographical scope of God's mission? Revelation 7, beginning at verse 9. After these things I looked, and behold, a great multitude which no one could number, of all nations, tribes, peoples, and tongues, standing before the throne and before the Lamb, clothed with white robes, with palm branches in their hands, and crying out with a loud voice, saying, Salvation belongs to our God, who sits on the throne, and to the Lamb. This week's lesson has intentionally discussed two crucial mission texts that emphasize the centrality of disciple-making in the Great Commission and the message of the eternal gospel. Interestingly, both texts have at least a common connecting point, the where of mission. They read in Matthew 28, 19, "'Go therefore and make disciples of all nations.'" And in Revelation 14, verse 6, those who dwell on the earth to every nation, tribe, tongue, and people. In other words, the gospel of Christ is to reach all classes, all nations, all tongues, and all peoples. The influence of the gospel is to unite the saved in one great brotherhood. We have only one model to imitate, and that is Christ. If we accept the truth as it is in Jesus, national prejudices and jealousies will be broken down, and the spirit of truth will blend our hearts into one. When Jesus said, You will be my witnesses, in Acts 1 verse 8, he had three different geographical areas in mind. Area 1, You will be my witnesses in Jerusalem. At that time, his disciples were very close to Jerusalem. So Jesus was basically saying, Begin to share your experience with God with people who are close to you. Mission begins at home, with family, with neighbours, with friends. This is the initial place of mission. Area 2, he then continues, in all Judea and Samaria. Our mission also involves those who are in some ways close, but at the same time distant from us. In this group are people who may speak the same language that we speak, People who have a similar culture but do not live or share the same reality that we do. This is our further place of mission. And area three, beyond this, Christ says, and to the end of the earth. God's mission calls us to reach individuals from all places, nations, people, groups, languages and ethnicities. This is our ultimate place of mission. And so to finish the day, first of all, we start with challenge. Pray every day this week for the community where you live. God has placed you there for a reason. And challenge up. Research the demographics of your area. What kind of people live around you? Ethnic and religious background, old, young, poor, wealthy, languages spoken, and so on. Ask God to show you how you may be a channel of his love to them. Friday, October 13. For a witness unto all nations. We read in the Advent Review and Sabbath Herald, an article by Ellen White on November 14, 1912. The Saviour's words, ye are the light of the world, point to the fact that he has committed to his followers a worldwide mission. As the rays of the sun penetrate to the remotest corners of the globe, so God designs that the light of the gospel shall extend to every soul upon the earth. If the Church of Christ were fulfilling the purpose of our Lord, light would be shed upon all that sit in the darkness and in the region and shadow of death. 
Instead of congregating together and shunning responsibility and cross-bearing, the members of the church would scatter into all lands, letting the light of Christ shine out from them, working as he did for the salvation of souls, and this gospel of the kingdom would speedily be carried to all the world. From all countries, the Macedonian call is sounding, Come over and help us. God has opened fields before us. Heavenly beings have been cooperating with men. Providence is going before us, and divine power is working with human effort. Blind indeed must be the eyes that do not see the working of the Lord, and deaf the ears that do not hear the call of the true shepherd to his sheep. Some have heard the call of God and have responded. Let every sanctified heart now respond by seeking to proclaim the life-giving message. If men and women in humility and faithfulness will take up their God-given appointed work, divine power will be revealed in the conversion of many to the truth. Wonderful will be the results of their efforts. End of quote. And that brings us to our three discussion questions for this week. One, the credibility of the church's influence in the community is determined mainly by the extent that we, the body of Christ, exemplify in our own lives God's love in the fulfilment of his mission. How do you personally respond to this challenge? Two, how do you think your church is seen and understood by its non-Adventist neighbours? How do you know? If the perception is positive, what can you do to strengthen it more? If it is negative, what can you do to change it? And three, why is keeping the eternal gospel at the centre of our mission to the world so important? What ultimate hope can we present to anyone anywhere that is not centred on the great hope we have because of the gospel, the good news of what Jesus has done for us on the cross? Two Boys, Two Prayers, Part 2 by Andrew McChesney Eight months passed of the miraculous answer to prayer, and Seventh-day Adventist Church members visited Father for a second time on a Sabbath in Conquery, Guinea. Fifteen people arrived with Father's sons, Junior and Emil, who attended an Adventist school on the church compound. We are here to pray, a church elder said. Father appreciated the gesture, but he had a question. Why do all other Christians go to church on Sunday, but you worship on Saturday, he asked. The elder invited Father to open his Bible to Exodus 20, verses 8 to 10. Father read, Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work, but the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord your God, in the New King James Version. But Father was unconvinced. The seventh day is Sunday, he said. The elder asked him to turn to Matthew 28, 1. Father read, Now after the Sabbath, as the first day of the week began to dawn, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary came to see the tomb. Father saw that the seventh day of the Bible was Saturday. I understand, he said. Let's pray. After the church group left, Father showed the verses to Mother. She was unmoved. No, we will stay in our church, she said. I don't care what they said. And even if our children go to their church, I won't leave my church. Father suggested a time of prayer and fasting. These questions started when our children began to attend that school, he said. We sent our children there to be educated. We don't know whether God sent our children to that church to lead us there. If this is the church of Jesus, let Jesus show us. Father and mother prayed and fasted for a week. If this is your will, let nothing prevent us from going to church next Sabbath, Father prayed. The next Sabbath, everything unfolded easily. Mother agreed to go to the Adventist church and church members warmly welcomed them. Father was incredibly happy afterward. He felt like a burden had been lifted. He hadn't been faithful in prayer before, but now he found the energy to pray regularly. As he prayed, God answered and his life changed. His work flourished, he began to 
get along with his parents and siblings. An older brother even named a child after him. He and mother gave their hearts to Jesus in baptism. I have peace, said father, whose name is Pepe Vocterine Soropagi. Jesus, hand in this church, and I thank God for bringing me here. Thank you for your 13th Sabbath offering three years ago that helped the Adventist Maranatha School expand into new buildings in Conakry, Guinea in the West Central Africa Division. Your 13th Sabbath offering this quarter will again help spread the gospel in the West Central African Division. This lesson was read by Dr. Percy Harold for Christian Services for the Blind. Sponsored by the Sabbath School Department and distributed through Hope Channel Australia, this podcast is also redistributed by Hope Channel Germany, Christian Record Services for the Blind. It is also available on SoundCloud and through multiple podcast distributors, including Apple iTunes. And you can listen and watch at the same time on YouTube. Remember, God is always faithful.